ask tonight just to start with uh, Psalm 23, Psalm 23, and then 2 Corinthians 12. Psalm 23 and 2 Corinthians 12 will be the two places we start uh, tonight. Before we dive into this, uh, where we started last week about walking through the valley, um, just wanted to give you just a couple real quick announcements of things, just to let you know as far as coming up this Sunday night, uh, so we'll have our normal life group Bible survey class and teen class and kids class on Sunday night at 6, but when that's over, probably about 7.15, we are having a diaper and wipes baby shower uh, for Virginia Greg and also for Madison Stanley. And this is Virginia's second child, this is Madison's first child, and you know, with Madison and Brandon being the first one, life is changing. Virginia's got this all under control, one, two, it don't matter, she's got it down. Uh, I don't know about Lewis, but anyway, we pray for all of them. That. But if you know well that you can have all kinds of stuff, but there's things you need, you need diapers, you need wipes, you never can have. I've never met anybody say, you know what, I got way too much of? I got way too many diapers and too many wipes. So I've never met a person that's ever said that. Uh, but so we want to do that. So after it's over, we're going to meet down at Fellowship Hall, just have a little bit of time just to kind of celebrate and these two families, but also just to uh, give those, you know, just to be a help, and uh, I know they would they would really appreciate that. Um, also, wanted to let you know about our churchwide activity going to the Macon Bacon baseball game on Saturday, May 25th. It's at seven o'clock, and Justin was telling us Sunday it's uh, seventeen dollars, but five of those dollars go back to our teenagers to help them for every ticket we sell to help them with teen camp, which is great. It includes you in the game there, and also all you can eat. And I found a very important uh, little fine print on that. It's all you can eat through the seventh inning, okay? I'm telling some of you that now, so you can plan on there in that seventh inning stretch to run as fast as humanly possible to get whatever you need. The ninth inning and taking it home, it don't work uh, as far as that. And, and then, of course, uh, not this Sunday, but next Sunday, 26, we're doing another fundraiser up the teenager that we're doing a burger and hot dog lunch. And, and some have asked, is that just you go pick it up at the fellowship? At the, uh, pavilion and leave or can we eat i'm just inviting everybody to like to stay and eat stay and eat you got to take it to go take it to go there's some little uh to go order slips in the lobby there that you're welcome to grab and i know it'd be a help we want to send any and all these kids to camp that we want and so we have a good time there all right so last week we started this on walking through the valley and we talked a lot about uh for a while the different types of valleys and that's just you know, I know it's just scratching the surface. When we talk about a valley that you're walking through, uh, you probably could look and say, after you mentioned it last week, Phil, thanks a lot. Now I'm aware of a lot more valleys than I'm walking through. I didn't think I was walking in them, but thanks a lot for that encouragement. A lot of these different things, you know, fear and discouragement and confusion and sickness, suffering, a lot of these things are valleys that we walk through as believers. And so we, we started looking at that and, and kind of just saying, you know, when it comes to the idea of the valleys that we walk through, it's very impartial, it's very inevitable but also it's very purposeful. So let's read this passage of Psalm 23, a psalm we know very well, but uh, I think it's good to try to read it like for the first time, okay? Psalm 23, verse 1, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff that comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What a beautiful passage. And when you see the middle of that, it says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And we said last week to understand that. The idea is not necessarily death is the end result. It's the idea of walking through the darkest shadows, the darkest valleys that you go through. And, you know, just thinking about this and, and rolling into it this week as we as we dive into it a little bit more where we started, um, I was talking to Rachel a little bit because I want to get the age correct, is uh, God's blessed us with four children. And in our situation, maybe you this way if you have kids, you always have one that we call the ER baby, the one that is just prone to if something's going to happen, it's going to happen to this one. Um, and we definitely had one of those, uh, Noah. 
I'm not going to hold back. Noah was the ER baby. Uh, thank God, especially when we had Maggie and then we had Noah, when it came for tolerance of pain, Noah just blew it out of the water, okay? I mean, he was great for tolerance of pain. I mean, we've actually, this kid, me and Little, sitting in one of the little chairs that fall over hit his head on a fireplace before. He's done all these different things he's done before. Maggie could sit outside and a butterfly could land on her plate and it's either look at this beautiful creation of God or this monster eating insect that's about to devour me, okay? You could look at Maggie in the wrong way, you could cut her fingernails, you know, clipping them, and she would be in tears. She had no threshold of pain. Noah, we're kind of like, are you human? You know, kind of thing. When he was two, he jumped off our, our bed, which is kind of a high rise bed at the time, fell, he's like, ow, like held his leg, and then kind of whimpered around for a day or two. And then we actually realized one day as I was holding him, he wanted his sippy cup. He slid down off the couch, fell flat on the floor, drug himself like an army guy under that, pulled himself up, grabbed the cup, came back to me. We're like, oh, this kid may have messed his leg up. Okay, so that's good. <laughs> so we're getting parent of the year, okay? Come to find out. They're like, yeah, it broke right here. And we're like, we did it. Anyway, and that idea. Wow. Yeah, so I don't know if he's got a great tolerance of pain or if there's some mental illness, I don't know, but uh, anyhow, we were blessed that way, but I remember it, it was a 20, it's 2009, Noah's four years old, it's typical Wednesday night service, we're in Columbia, South Carolina, Palmetto Baptist Temple, uh, where Rachel's dad, pastor dad, we do very similar Wednesday night service like we do here, we have some uh, time of singing, we have a time of prayer, and different things, and then myself, or either Rachel's dad would always uh, preach or teach okay so we're over and, and it's in a gym it's a gym of touring I don't know if you ever went to church in a gym it can be loud it can be those things things were sectioned off we had kind of the sanctuary in one part but what we did after every Wednesday night it was just our habit that the choir always practiced the song they were gonna sing Sunday immediately after the service uh, and so we used to always have fun in fact Matt Cropsey that y'all probably remember from uh, being here at a missions conference, me and Matt would get up there and me and Matt would be ready to go home and there'd still be people out there talking and we'd be like, we're waiting for you. And we would just kind of do all these kind of fun things. But the kids would always run 90 to nothing in the back playing. And I remember it was, it was winter, so they were inside and the kids were playing a game called wall ball. Wall ball, I still don't understand it. I played some dumb stuff in my life, King of the Hill. Those kind of things that we did. But wall ball is one of those things where you line up about, I don't know, from here to that wall, every kid spread out, and someone would throw a ball. And if you caught the ball, great. You just throw the ball again. But if you drop the ball, you have to run and touch the wall before they peg you with the ball. <laughs> it's in Job chapter 3. No, I'm kidding. I mean, it's just <laughs> very broad. And they're playing with like this dodgeball, right? And Noah's out there, and he's four years old, and there's a bunch of his cousins and other ones playing. The kids probably up to 12 years old playing. And, of course, he is just, you know, I won't play, I won't play, I won't play. I was like, okay, buddy, play, I'm going to car play. So he's out there, and so we're sitting there, and I'm watching. Because I got a direct line of sight. Noah tries to catch a ball, doesn't catch it, realizes I have to run. So he starts sprinting as fast as the little dude could go at the time, and he's tall and skinny now. He was not tall and skinny for a long time. Okay, he was kind of short and pudgy uh, for a long time. So he's just kind of waddling as fast as he can to that wall. One of the kids picked it up. Uh, I think it was actually um, Brent's nephew Chandler, if I remember correctly. Chandler's like probably like nine or a few years older. He takes the ball like I would do. Here's a little kid. I've got permission because it's in the rules of the game. Takes that dodge ball and hurls it at Noah. Well, Noah gets almost to the wall. The ball hits his legs, flips him in the air, and he falls. Now, in the walls there at that church, you have a cinder block wall. And y'all know what I mean when I say cove basing, like you have something at the bottom of the wall. Well, normally you have like a little piece of wood, like finish the trim like that, or you have this kind of rubber covering. They have, for some reason, like two by fours that were against the wall. Well, as Noah falls, he hits his head on the edge of that two by four. But it's not just that simple because he's the ER baby. There was actually a finishing nail that was sticking out and it hits him and hooks him in the back of the head and so we're practicing choir I see it and I'm kind of like get up you know I kind of <laughs> so we get up he's bleeding a lot 
we take him, we take him to the emergency room, and of course the whole time he's in the emergency room, I don't want a shot, I don't want a shot, I don't want a shot. And I'm like, dude, there's like a gash in the back of your head. You don't want a shot. I know for some of you in here that's like horrible, and some of you that in the nursing field are like, this is awesome. What did they do? Okay, well, so we get there, and so he is just, you know, he's a strong little dude, man. He is just fighting it, and this and he's tears in his eyes, Daddy, don't let him give me a shot, don't let him give me a shot. Don't let him give me a shot like that. And so finally, they're trying to work on his head, and he's fighting it. And they finally said, either we're going to have to wrap him, or you're going to have to hold him down. I'm like, oh, wrap him. Wrap him. <laughs> wrap him. All day long, wrap him. But you got to hold him down to wrap him. So I actually, to my four-year-old son, with tears in his eyes and betrayal and fire that just pierced my soul, am laying on him with my forearm as much as I can, so they can wrap him, and eventually they put in the, the numbing uh, medicine right there, and he's in therapy today, and he's fine. No, I'm not going to therapy today, but he's okay. But in moments like that, and I kind of reflected on that, that's where I think we get some of the best idea and understanding when it comes to God and our suffering. Because I had to physically hold down my child so someone else could inflict pain on that child so that child could be tended to, could be healed, could be starting to grow and develop and to keep things from getting worse. So it's kind of a front row seat. Because I remember when he was born, when Maggie was born, I was so scared I didn't hold her. In fact, I asked a friend of mine if I could hold her for the first time. I was like, man, I'm gonna break this thing. I remember holding Noah. And I remember thinking to myself, I will kill somebody if they inflict pain or even look wrong at this kid. But here I am, the one that's holding him down for that. And like I said, I believe in that moment, as much as he did not understand, and regardless of his betrayal that he felt like I had no shot, you know, all those things and all the tears in his eyes, it gave me the best understanding I think I could do as a parent to understand God and our suffering. Because if we look at it in that moment, we're like, no, we don't understand. It doesn't make sense. Why are you allowing this to happen to me? You're the one that's supposed to protect me. You're the one that's supposed to make it all better. And I think when we think about walking through the valley of these dark shadows and all of these things that come and suffering, I think what we realize or fail to realize sometimes is that there's a culture that we're in today that life is all about happiness and good times and nothing ever going wrong. And the truth is that's just not reality. It's not the reality of the Bible. I mean, if you read the Bible, the Bible is full of a lot of gritty, a lot of messy, a lot of really bad things that happen to people in that that God has allowed. And ultimately, God has allowed for a purpose. And like we said here the last week, it's impartial, it's inevitable, but it's purposeful. We're really going to look at that next week if, if the Lord lets me stay on that path that I am about suffering. But in thinking about this a little bit, we talked about this and we said, well, what do we do when we walk through the valley? And I'm not going to go through everything like I did last week, but we said some things that you need to do when you're walking through the valley is you need to intentionally spend time with God. And I use that word intentionally. Because if you don't intentionally, purposely spend time with God, things will distract you, things will cloud your mind, you will not spend time with God. You have to intentionally spend time with God. And, and the thing is, maybe even the idea is extra. If you need, when you're walking through that valley of confusion, you're walking through decisions, storms, different things, suffering. You have to be intentional about uh, that time with God. And then we, and that involves God's word. And then also what we talk about here is make prayer a priority. Because for some of us, that's a, hey, how's your prayer life? You're like, dude, man, my prayer life's off the chain, man. I'm great. How is it is with, you know, reading and meditating on the Bible? And then some of us are the flip of that. We can read all day long, but talking to God is... A little different. He said, Phil, none of them are good. That's okay. That's what we walk through. <laughs> That's the idea of walking through. So we talk about making those things a priority, especially during times of trial. 
we always have to remember that faith is revealed through trial. Faith is not revealed through always good times. Is that those are times we build it, there's times we store it, but really that revealing, that strengthening comes to the time. But there's also the idea we talked about this is keep walking. The Bible says, yea, though I walk through. It doesn't say I sit in the middle of it. No, yea, though I'm walking through the valley. He didn't even say walking out of it. He said I'm walking through it. And, and, and that idea is, and I use that horrible 80s example of all those old films that, you know, somebody, everybody's running for their life and there's always that one person that trips on nothing and they're just going to lay there and they're just, I can't do it, go on. You're like, dude, come on, let's go. And you want to tell them, get up, keep running, keep moving, those kind of things. And, and the idea is sometimes in life, it's the same thing. We're walking through this valley and we stumble and fall and we're just like, I'm just going to let it take me. I'm just going to let it consume me. But we need to get up and we need to keep going. And then we ended with this one, and I want to pick up the passage in 2 Corinthians a moment. But when you're walking through the valley, you have to be willing to receive God's grace. I want God's help a lot of times in my life, but I want God's help to be the way I want it to be. I want God's grace, but I want God's grace in the form and the shape that I feel like I need it to be. And, and so the idea is receiving the grace of God for what we need. Over in 2 Corinthians, and I guess it helps if I get there. 2 Corinthians chapter number 12, very familiar passage of scripture. Uh, I know we started reading just a little bit of it, but we really didn't dive into it for time. But uh, 2 Corinthians chapter number 12, verse number 7. Again, this is the Apostle Paul. And he says, Lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. So he says, basically just to let you know, he said, to keep me from getting prideful and arrogant is what he just said. To keep me from being prideful and arrogant, I was given a thorn in the flesh. Okay, ready? Here's a thorn in the flesh. A messenger of Satan to buffet me. That word buffet sounds really spiritual. It means beat me. So a messenger, a demonic spirit of Satan to beat me down. Lest I should be exalted above measure. And for this thing, I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart me. Okay, again, really beautiful, lofty language in the Bible there. He says this, God, to help me from getting prideful, allowed, sent a demonic spirit to beat me down. And I besought the Lord. means I begged and pleaded. This is like your kids asking for one more hour to stay up at night. You know how they beg and leave? I will do anything you want. I will cut the grass. I will wash the house. I will do whatever it is you want me to do. Please let me stay up or please don't make me go to school. But in a much more intense version, think about Paul. He says, I pled with the Lord. Paul pleaded with the Lord. Not once, not twice, but three times. God, take it away. God, take it away. God, take it away. And look what it says. And he, who, who's he? Christ said unto me, my grace, not your grace, but my grace is sufficient for thee or is enough for thee for my strength or my power is made perfect in weakness most gladly therefore Paul says but I rather glory in my infirmities or my weaknesses that the power of Christ may rest upon me therefore I take pleasure in my infirmities in my reproaches in necessities in persecutions in distresses for Christ's sake for when I am weak then am I strong so Paul again Danger of the familiar, right? It says, I pled with God. Please take it away. To where Christ says, hey, Paul, I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm doing. Not only do I know what I'm doing, my strength is enough to carry you through this. Your strength is not. Receive my grace. Receive my strength. Rely on me for this. And that's where we ended. Uh, last week. I just wanted to touch that just for a moment. But again, thinking this week and like I said, looking at these different ones, and I know I told you last week, I think I had like 12 of them. I'm going to try to combine some of them. We're not going to get through all of them this week. Definitely with that, but I wanted to, to share a few more of these with you, with you. And one of these, it kind of seems like it goes against number three, but let me just tell you this. Is, and this is something, again, we don't like to do, but when you're in the valley, you have to wait on the Lord. You have to wait on the Lord. Um, 
Have you ever had a situation where someone's come up to you, they're all flustered, they're all angry, they're all upset, they're crying, whatever it may be, so angry, and they're just telling you all about the situation, I mean, this is going, and they're like, I don't understand why you let this happen, I don't understand why they're doing this, I don't understand why you let them do this, and you finally said, if you'll just stop long enough and listen to me, if you'll just wait, you'll understand. Now, the truth of the matter is there are some things in life we will never understand and God will never give us the why. And we have to be willing to accept that. But this idea of waiting on God. And the idea with suffering is that suffering always reminds us the inability to control our own lives. I do not control when I go in the valley or not in the valley. That is by God. God is sovereign and God's in control. And I have to be able to trust Him even when I don't see Him working. In those things, I have to be willing to be patient in those things. And the idea of waiting on the Lord, I know this is a passage of Scripture we, we use a lot, but James chapter 1, James chapter 1, verses one through five, 2 through 5, excuse me, uh, talking this idea of waiting on God and, and just waiting for what God wants to do. Uh, James chapter 1, verse 2 says, My brother, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations or different types of trials, knowing this, that the trying of your faith, work of patience or endurance, but let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire or complete, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, to give it to all men liberally, and if it not, it shall be given to him. See, we kind of, a lot of times, if we're honest, we go from verse 2, count it all joy when you fall into different types of diverse temptations. And then we jump right down to verse number 5, where verse 5 says, you know, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Verse 3 and 4 are big. Verse 3 and 4 talk about waiting on God, talks about endurance, talks about patience, and it says, let it have its complete work. Let it have its complete work. And that way you can understand it. That way you can go through it. There, there's so many other passages of Scripture that we can look at with this. Uh, back in the book of uh, Job, uh, Job uh, chapter 23, and I was going to quote some of these, but I don't trust myself when I get up here to do that. Job chapter 23, verse number 10. Job is kind of arguing his cause, so to speak. And in Job 23, 10, he says, But he, speaking of God, he knoweth the way that I take. And when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Now, nowhere in that is Job in control of that time now. No way in there is Job in control of how long he has to wait on God. And I mentioned this last week. We have no record of God ever explaining to Job why he did what he did to Job. No record. I mean, again, Joseph, Genesis, bad stuff. At least at the end, he kind of got to see it, kind of understand it, kind of got to put the pieces together. Not Job. Job had to wait on God, rely on God. Yeah, you know, he, he eventually had double what he had. He had you know, children again, different things. But even in the midst of that saying, having children again, he still lost children. He still went through great grieving and loss. But he just says, you know what? I, God knows the way that I take God. And when he's tried me and when he's finished, I shall come forth as gold. A lot of great verses there speaking about that. Just understanding, it just reminds him his inability to that. Over in the book of Psalm, uh, Psalm, let's look at Psalm 27. Psalm 27, and uh, we're going to read verse 14 here just a second. It says this, Psalm 27, verse 14. He says, actually back up to verse 13 if you want to. I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. You kind of pick up, he kind of told him twice. <laughs> he says, you know what I'm telling you, right? wait on the Lord. I want you to be of good courage. God's going to strengthen you. He's going to strengthen your heart. God's going to come through. He said, but hey, wait on the Lord. Kind of like when you look at one of your kids and say, now, I want you to stop when you get to the end of the street, okay? Because I don't want a car to come. I don't want this to happen. I'll be there in just a minute. But what I said was, you better stop when you get to the end of the street. That's kind of the same mentality.
Wait on the Lord. Wait. And he says here, I love how, you know, David says, he says, I would have fainted. I would have perished. Unless I had, what, believed to see the goodness of God. Unless I really believed. By the way, you will not wait on God if you do not believe God is good. That's right. The amount of time we're willing to wait on God is to the degree we believe God is good and God is for me. And, and that's in a real living out way. So we believe God is good. We just a lot of times believe God is good for other people. You know, because they, they're good Christians. I'm stinking at this thing. Or, man, they do this and I don't do that. And maybe this or that or the other. And we have a lot of internal grief that we struggle, that we go with. But the amount that you're willing to wait on God is the amount that you really believe in the goodness of God to you and in that situation. So waiting on the Lord, you see there. And then the next one, because I want to get through some of these. And, and I'm going to combine these two. Uh, with Dave, we might be here just a second. But when you're walking through the valley, you've got to guard your thoughts and words. Guard your thoughts and words. I will say this because I've done this. I will say this because it's been done to me. Hurting people hurt people. That's just the truth. Hurting people hurt people. You're hurt. That's the moment you lash out. That's the moment you say that, you type that, whatever it is, that text, whatever that thing is you say. Hurting people, you have to guard your thoughts. Remember, whatever you're going through in the valley, God has it for a purpose, and it's ultimately not for your destruction, for your end. It's not to undo your walk with Christ. It's to cement that. It's to make it better. But let's talk about the idea of guarding your thoughts. So, when you're walking through, just I mean, you pick any of them. Let's just say sickness. You have some struggle physically in your life that you weren't expecting, and all of a sudden you're like, "What's the deal, man? And what's going on? Why, why is this happening? I got things I got to do. I got things going on. I mean, why am I allowing that?" And then you can look at fear, you can look at suffering, you look at uncertainty. You got decisions you got to make, confusion. Different things, people are doing things that you never thought they would do. You can pick any of those things or anything else that you can throw up on the board. But what is the thing that, number one, gets attacked? Your thoughts, right? And I've said it before, I'm going to say it a lot because it's very true in my life. No one will speak to you more than you will speak to yourself. From the moment you wake up, you start talking to yourself. Maybe not audibly where everybody knows you're crazy, but you know you're going to start talking, okay? Maybe some of you do. It's okay, all right? I'm the kind of guy, you got to dump it all out on the table, organize the thoughts. It scares people sometimes, but it helps me out, okay? Anybody else like that, you just got to say it all and then organize it? Anybody that terrify you? Want to, no, okay, don't do that. But you know, you know what I mean? It's like, what are you doing? Oh, you just need to do that. Okay, good. It's like taking all the toys and dumping them out, and then you can put everything back in order so it fits perfectly and where it's supposed to go. You know, the OCD that where it's supposed to go in life, you know, things. But the idea is here, you've got to guard your thoughts. I mean, the idea of your thought life, and, and of course there's verses that we could read, the idea of your thoughts. I really believe over in John chapter 8, verse 44, it talks a lot about, about Jesus talking about you are of your father the devil, and he is, he is a liar. And, and let me tell you this, I've never, and I don't mean this in any sacrilegious way, I've never sat down in my house and had a verbal conversation with Satan. Not one time or a demon, or anything like that. I've never had that. But how does my mind get access? How do I believe the lies? But here, I think it. I think it, I question it, I start doubting, doubting the goodness of God, wondering about this, doubting myself, doubting all those things. It's through your mind. The mind is that thing that if you don't guard your mind, it affects the way that you live. It affects who you really are in your heart, out of the heart the mouth speaketh. You've got to guard your heart, but you have to guard your mind in those things. You've got to be really careful there. Um, Isaiah chapter 26, um, verses number 3 and 4, kind of, uh, not that we have church verses, but if you go to the website, they, they have these verses. And so, some of you didn't know we had a website, but anyhow, it's okay. Cool. It's all right. But it says this, speaking of guarding your, your mind, Isaiah 26, 3 and 4, it says, Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusted in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever, 
for the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Okay? Everlasting strength. So he says he'll keep him in perfect or complete peace. He's what? Mind. You got to keep your mind right. Um, we used to joke about this. Thinking, thinking makes you act a bad way. You got to be careful of thinking, thinking. And whatever that may be, you got to have your mind right. You got to have your mind correct. You know, that I did that God says, I will keep you in perfect peace. It doesn't say that you won't be in the valley. Remember, peace and no struggle do not always go together. Sometimes the greatest peace you can feel in the world is when you're walking in the valley. When everything else is falling apart, you're <laughs> the closest to God. Remember we talked about that last week. I feel like sometimes the, I can hear God the clearest, or God seems to be speaking the clearest when I'm walking through the valley. And more than likely, God's not talking louder. I'm just listening more. But I've got to be careful in that. I've got to have my mind right. I've got to, have, I've got to guard my mind. I've got to guard those things. I will tell you that a lot of people that fall and walk away, not, not church, let's make it bigger, let's make it a little bit more personal, they'll walk away from the Lord, so to speak, and they have those seasons, is because, you say, well, something was done to them, right, but it's how mentally they handled what was done to them is now determining and dictating how they're going to act and how they're going to shut down or how they're going to do it. It's the mind, right? I mean, let, let's just be real warm and fuzzy. You're always going to have bad stuff done to you until the day you die. God bless you. Thanks for coming to church. Okay, I get it, right? And I would love to say that bad things are going to happen to you or be done to you only from those who don't like you. But that would be a lie. There's going to be times. It's not called betrayal because the enemy turns on you. It's not called discouragement because the person he knows against you does something to you. Because someone you don't expect to does. That's the discouragement. That's the betrayal. That's those things in your life. And you have to guard your mind in those times. Philippians chapter 4. And you're like, Phil, why are you using verses in Philippians? We're going to be going through Philippians. By Christmas, we'll be in Philippians 4. Man, it's going to be great. I'm just kidding. It'll probably be a different holiday. But Philippians 4, one verse. I love chapter 4. It's like first or second favorite chapter in the Bible. Love it. He lists all kinds of things. And then Paul, everything about the peace of God, rejoice evermore, be careful, anxious for nothing. And then he finally says this in verse 8. Right after he says the peace of God that passes all understanding. Right after he says this, he says this in verse 8. Finally, or the last big thing, brother, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, that means a good report, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, or whatsoever things are noble means, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be anything praise or anything praiseworthy, think on these things. So he's just told them, you're going through this. We've been walking through the Philippian church about unity, humility. If you've been here on Sundays, we have been beating that unity and humility drum. We've been doing that. We've looked at the last two weeks of Christ as the example. He's beating that drum, and he says in here, what is going to be the key to this? He says, if I'm leaving you with one thing, make sure you're thinking of things that are noble, think of things that are pure, think sure of things that are lovely, good report, virtue, all of those things. He says, if anything's praiseworthy, think about that. That's what he's telling. Them. And he's like, do I have to come that Sunday? Well, it's going to be a few months, but you know, yeah, you can come that Sunday if you want. There's a lot of stuff there, but we have to guard our thoughts. And, and can I say it like this? There are going to probably be situations and already have in your life that, are, let's just be honest, that tragedy is so mind-numbing and there's so many variables that we will not and cannot know. And if we determine that I'm not going to get peace and resolution until I know why, I'm telling you, you're allowing your mind to be just attacked. You are putting every wall down because anything could possibly be the answer anything could possibly be the truth there are going to be some mind numbing things that probably have in your life happen and you will not and cannot get all those and so that's what we have to understand we have to fix our mind on you see the reason I read this verse if I just say hey fix your mind on the goodness of God you're like thanks Phil well, this is Paul saying these are the things noble true lovely virtue character all those things encouragement he said those are the things you need to think about that's the things you need to consider. He 
you have to remember the devil is a liar and he's going to whisper in that ear a lot and often and honestly people talk about the world the flesh and the devil I normally don't even make it a lot to the world or the devil because my flesh normally does double time on me and so just remember those things guard your thoughts and those things and then I know I said I combined them just because I want to look like it the board went longer with that but you got to guard your words I've got to guard my words Again, hurting people hurt people. There's no many times in our life when we're walking through something, we say something. Even if we get forgiveness for it, it's there, man. I mean, the toothpaste is out of the tube, and you can try to cram all the toothpaste back in it. It doesn't work. It just makes a bigger mess. You just got to clean it up and go on. And the idea here is we have to be understand. We have to be easy. It is to when we can do that. And, and a lot of times, if we're honest, we have probably said some of the most hurtful things when we're hurting. Whether it's to our spouse, whether it's to another person, whether it's to our children, whether it's to somebody else we love, we have probably said some of the most hurtful things to people that we love whenever we've been hurting. And it's just like, well, I should be able to vent. Well, there's a difference between venting and being hurtful. There's a big difference. We can't justify. Well, if you just knew what I was going through, I should get a pass. If you want to pass, if I want to pass, go into the situation saying, I'm about to say some hurtful stuff. Is that cool with you? Yes? Thank you. Okay, now, okay. we don't do that. <laughs> we live all in the emotions, all in those moments. And, and a lot of times, you know, often people with a lot of hurt will speak from that hurtful moment and those hurtful words. And, and whether it's speaking or whether it's typing and texting, and I mean, that's the thing. It used to be you could just say it to somebody or call somebody on the phone, but now we can text them, now we can post it, now we can do all these things. You know, I see all these little memes all the time, I think are really funny. It's talking about, you know, the Holy Spirit when he tells me to delete what I just started texting or posting, and I get that. But, you know, you ever hear someone say, hey, when you go through something, you're really hurt, don't make a big decision in life when you're really hurt, when you're really going through something. Can I just maybe add a little something to that? Don't talk. Don't post. Don't text when you're really in a hurtful moment unless you're asking for help. Now, asking for help is one thing. Be careful when you jump on different things because when you're hurting, a lot of times we'll blame stuff on the Holy Spirit, but it wasn't the Holy Spirit. It's just me trying to get into that. So guard your thoughts. Guard your words. I was just for fun tonight going to have us read all of James chapter 3. We're not going to do that. But if you want to see the importance of words, I'll be honest with you, James is a book I try to read once a month. It's, don't get impressed. It's not reading like the book of Exodus or, you know, it's not like that, okay? It's got five chapters, okay? It's not that. But I'm telling you, there is a very practical Christian living that's in the book of James. Pretty much all James chapter 3 is about is the words that you say. And it's pretty powerful. And it's pretty potent about what it is. That you know that you know death and life are in the power of the tongue. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. I'll give you some of these verses for time tonight. We're not going to look at them, but Psalm 34, verses one through four, really deal with these. These are some good things here. Just wanted to just give you maybe look them up about the word guarding your words. Also uh, in Proverbs, there's two passages in Proverbs. Proverbs 18:21. Proverbs 18, 21. Um, and then also Proverbs 29, 11. Proverbs 29, 11. Of course, I said the whole chapter of James, chapter 3. And I do want to read to us the one in 1 Peter. If you take a second and flip over. 1 Peter, chapter number 3. So, 1 Peter chapter 3, um, I'll pick it up in uh, verse number, I'll just do verse number 10. By the way, he has just walked through in the beginning part of chapter 3 about a husband and wife relationship, so I'm just going to lay that as a groundwork for what he's about to say about husband and wife together, okay? He talks about don't be railing for railing, evil for evil, but here's what he says, 1 Peter 3, verse 10. For he that will love life 
and see good days. If you're like me, take notes in church. I love my life. I want to see good days. What is it, Phil? What does the Bible say? Let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile or deceit. I don't know about you, but it's kind of like a sucker punch right there. Like I was ready for this golden nugget of the Bible when I first read that. Like, man, who would love life. I want a life that's all of joy and all of love and all of, I want to see good days. You know what he basically has told me to do? When you're mad, when you're angry, shut up. <laughs> that's what he basically has said. Refrain. You know what it means there to refrain? It means to turn away from, which lets me know something. That means that when I am hurt, that when I am going through a valley, I'm going to have things approach me. They're going to make me a lot easier to say things that are wrong, to say hurtful things. So I have to refrain. I have to turn from those things and go away. So I have to turn from those things. And it says in verse 7, let him eschew or hate evil and do good and let him seek peace and ensue it or pursue it. I mean, if verse 10 wasn't enough. If you're angry, you're going. If you want to see good days, refrain from speaking evil. But then he goes on and says, if you really want to, you really want to do, you want long life, or not long life, but you want good life, love life, good days. He says, do good and not to seek peace, but make that what you pursue. You want to want, you want to know what I pursue whenever I'm walking through a valley? Justice. I don't want peace. I want to be right. I want to be even. I want to settle the score. And I don't want to get even. If you're like me occasionally, I want to get ahead a little bit. So you're like, well, Phil, I'm not that way. I just want to get even. No, you don't. You want to get ahead. Okay, we all do. Okay? But he says here, instead of seeking your justice, seek peace. We always say this, and it's, it's not originally, but always own what you can own, and maybe a little bit more. If you want to be a peacemaker, you have to own what you can own, and sometimes a little bit more in that. You say, well, that's not what I feel. Well, we can't let feelings drive the bus. Okay? All right. And then, this last one that we'll do with time, and I'll run quickly through this one. And I like the word seek because I think it is important, but seek godly counsel. So when you are walking through a valley, I would encourage you Seek this. Well, somebody will come ask me about my problem. Nobody cares about me. Ain't nobody asked me how my day's going. I'm, I mean, I'm suffering right now, man. I'm, I'm going through it right now. I'm, I'm confused. I'm, I got storms. I got fear. I've got, I got certain. It says seek it. It means pursue it. Because here's why. I am really good at making you think I'm okay. And so are you. You're really good at making everybody in your life think you're okay. There's normally two types of people. Thus, everything's okay, or everything's always bad, so we can't really tell the difference when things are okay. Okay, sorry, I'll keep going. But you know what I mean? It's normally one or the other. The world's always on fire. How are you doing that? Oh, I'm good. That's good. All the time. That's good. That's like, I mean, we, we, we have a good way of doing that. So the idea and understanding is... is are you seeking when you're in the valley? Are you seeking godly counsel? Now again, I always want to preface it with this. Be careful what you share with people. Be careful that you do not, in your life, share things that are so personal, so make you so vulnerable, if that person you don't really trust. I'll be honest with you, I only have a handful of people in my life that I can be completely vulnerable with. I don't have thousands. Facebook says I have 787 friends. <laughs> I do not have 787 friends that I can personal with. But can I be honest with you? I see a lot of people on Facebook that treat all 787 friends like they're the closest friends. And I'm telling you, you're setting yourself up for heartache. You know, be careful who you tell people things to. But I'm telling you, when God gives you those people, when he gives you those people, thank them, pray for them, ask them, how they're doing but man those are the people that you can pour into those are the people you can be vulnerable with I always say it like this Jesus 
way before the cross had multitudes of people following him. When the miracles started to slow down and he started teaching about who he was the son of God, that, that group got a little bit smaller. And then he started doing the ministry that he did and different things and that group got down to about 12. But do you even remember when Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane and he's praying great swaps of blood, drops of blood? Do you remember he didn't look at the 12 and say, pray ye, tarry ye here for me. He told three. And ultimately, when you get to the cross, there's one. Hey, John, that's my mama. She's now your mama. Mama, this is your son. It's interesting, the closer you get to the cross, the real crux of it all, the smaller that group is. Be careful you're not sharing your innermost struggles and valleys with the masses when it's meant for the three. Or maybe even for the one. And like I said, when you get those people, have those people. You know, you get those vital crossroads. But I'm not telling you this. This is not an excuse to, huh, I ain't sharing up with nobody. Well, here's what's going to happen when you don't have someone you can get godly counsel and you can talk to. You're going to probably really struggle on number six. The words and the thoughts are going to be too much. It's going to be too loud. And, and so we need those people that we can get counsel with. We need those people that we can reach out to, those that can be a help to us. I'm going to read a couple of verses here. Uh, Psalm 16. Psalm 16. And um, verse number verse number 7. He says, I will bless the Lord who hath given me counsel my reigns also instruct me in the night seasons. He says, I'm going to bless the Lord because God's given me counsel. Now, he's talking about God giving him counsel. But you know what? When you look at David's life at the very end, David gives his mighty men. And he starts listing those at the beginning of the mighty men. He starts listing those who were the ones that were the most important to him, the ones that were there for him. And when he lists those different people, he lists those that he could have counsel with. He lists those that he could really entrust in those things. I mean, you think about David's life had to be the one of the most craziest lives there was. He had people in his life he could talk to. I remember this even one time and I forgot the guy's name off the top of my head. David's like, you know what? I think we're getting to be a pretty vast kingdom right now. Let's number the people. Let's see how many soldiers I got. Let's see how many people I got. And, and I'm not 100% sure I want. I, I, I'm going to say it wrong if I do so. One of his generals came to him and said, hey, don't. Didn't God tell you he'll increase you as much as you need to be increased? Just don't number the people. Don't do a census. He said, you remember God told you don't do a census because then your strength and your faith and your trust is not going to be in God. It's going to be that I got 562,000 troops or whatever it was. He said, don't number them because when you do that, you're going to rely on the number instead of rely on me. And so, but David did it anyways, right? But David still, thank God, even though David went away from the council, David still had somebody. And hey, didn't God say this, man? Didn't he tell you this? Didn't God promise this to you? And I'm very thankful I can look back. I'm very thankful for the people that gave me godly counsel, even the godly counsel I didn't listen to. And I've had to go to people and say, hey, thank you. I did not take your advice at all. But thank you for being faithful and just being honest with me about what I should do. Well, you should seek that godly counsel because it's definitely vital. And then some other great verses of that in Proverbs is Proverbs 11, 14, uh, chapter 12, verse 15, and then chapter 20, verse 5. But we're going to dive into more next week with it. And like I said, I, I don't want to prolong any of this, but I'll just tell you, this is something that I find myself in a lot. And I, I'm a guy that needs practical tools. But maybe these are some things maybe this week that you can think about in the valley you're walking through. Hey, if nothing else, if you're not walking through a valley, I know it, we should be seeking out people whenever we're going through something, but maybe we should seek out people that we know might be going through a hard time. Because there's plenty of them. You probably don't have to look past your house, and I know you don't have to look past your pew to find people that are going through stuff. And I'll just tell you, sometimes the greatest blessing to me when I'm walking through a valley to be a blessing to someone else that's walking through a valley. This helps them and encourages them.
Appreciate you being here tonight. Go ahead and stand together. We'll close in a word of prayer. God, again, we thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, for all that you do for us. And Lord, I thank you for your word. There's so many things that we can see here. Lord, we know our reality is that we will suffer. We will go through things. We will go through valleys. Some will be for seasons, God, and we know some of the things we may not ever completely come out of. But God, as we'll definitely look at next week, I thank you that even as you say in that beautiful text, though I walk through the valley, those darkest shadows, and most importantly, you're with us. We have your presence. And truly, God, that's all we need. It's nice to have other things, but in reality, God, I thank you that you're with us. Lord, I pray you help us to guard our hearts, guard our minds, guard our words, guard our thoughts. God, that we'll learn to wait on you, that we'll, we'll learn to receive your grace in the different things. And God, help us to be that type of example that could be someone that people could get counsel from, that could get encouragement from. Thank you for all you do in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for coming.